Welcome to Share.Care, an all-inclusive community sharing experience, strength, and hope to create strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. Share.Care communities work toward every individual feeling safe, valued, and heard, free from the threat of danger, pain, or harm. Each episode, founder Damian Andrews explores the principles underpinning Share.Care and invites expert special guests to share their knowledge so you can easily reap the benefits so many others experience. You hold the choice to create your future. Let it be with strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. Hello and welcome to another On the Couch episode of the Share.Care podcast. Our belief is that global peace starts at home. Feeling safe, valued and heard gives you a foundation to confidently step out and make the world a happier and safer place for everyone. Because in today's world, it's in your own selfish best interest to help others. Today, money. Money, 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 money. Money is one of the principles of share. Why is it a principle? It provides security for you and your family. It opens you up to being able to do things and it opens you up to being able to help others. I know from my perspective, there's been times where I've wanted to help others, but I haven't had the money to be able to do it. So it's really, it is a very important principle within SHARE. And when I look back at my life, it's had its ups and downs with money. Uh, There's times where I've had no money at all, been hand to mouth. I I grew up, well, my background, my parents, my grandparents were refugees from World War II. They came to Australia with nothing but their clothes on their back and they made a way for themselves. Uh, In doing that, when they first got here, my, my, the women and children were sent to a camp called Bonagilla repatriation camp and my grandfather went and found work uh, it was about six seven hours away from where they were and it wasn't like today where you had mobile phones and you were constantly in contact the way to stay in contact was via letter and they saw each other roughly every six weeks until he saved up enough money to buy some land he built a two-room house two room not two bedroom two room house with a dirt floor and my mum and not my mum my grandmother and my dad and his sister moved down to be with my granddad so they came here with a uh, little money and built up um, some money and I'll explain a bit more about that later from my perspective you know, I didn't have we didn't have a lot growing up we were comfortable but we didn't have a lot we i went through phases where i was earning a lot of money and there was times where i i didn't have a job at all and i had no money and so it went backwards and forwards and i know from those times being in a position where you have money and have plenty of money there was a time with some friends of mine they at a um uh, that I knew from a drama class, uh, one of their classmates died, uh, died in a, a motorbike accident. And the where the funeral was, it was difficult for, because he came from a rural town, it was difficult for the class members to get there because they weren't that well off themselves. And this was in Western Australia when I was there. It's a big state and, and spread out. Um, but I was in a position where I was actually earning a lot at that time and I was able to hire a car uh, that was big enough for everyone to get in and, um, and take people to the funeral. So I was able to help out because I had the money to do so. And there's been a number of times in my life where I've seen both sides. I've, I've missed out on being able to help people. I wasn't able to help people because I, I couldn't look after myself because I didn't have the money. And then there's been times later where I've had the money and I've been able to do a number of things and, and give a lot of money uh, to whether it's either give money directly and I've, I've donated 
quite a, a large amount of money throughout my life. I've also done things where I've been able to provide people with things because I've had the money to do so. This is where money is a really important foundation because it does give you that security and it does give you the ability to help others significantly. And then when we look at a more global scale, when we look at things like investments in cancer research, I mean, that takes money. I mean, that takes donations from people to, to do that. The money doesn't just come from nowhere. The research doesn't just happen. Um, you know, you, people need to be paid to do that research. Uh, the, you need equipment, you need all those kind of things, and that costs money. And that's why money is really, really important to have a good control on. So what there is two things to do with money. One, there's earning money, and then there's keeping money. They're two different mindsets, and you need both. And I've been in that situation where I've, I've earned a lot of money and I didn't hold on to it, <laughs> and it's gone. And... It is a mindset, and and for me, one of the mindset shift was changing to need to spend less than you earn, and that's really boring and and, and annoying and sucks. Uh, so I changed my mindset to I'm going to earn more than I spend, and that made that small change made a significant difference in my situation as as far as earning capacity. And you know, from when, when we compare it, so that I've I've had no situation where I've had no money and I'm sure people can relate to that and I've been on the opposite side where you know I've taken a private helicopter and flown into Monaco it's you know th that's a different lifestyle and so that's available um, for people if, if that's something that you choose now I think and this is a part where probably when I look back on it having money earning money and having money uh, is relatively easy. Um, it doesn't feel like it at the time. Uh, but like most things, when you have the skill, when you have the knowledge, and you are the person you need to be, then it becomes relatively easy. If you think about any skill that you do relatively well, it's not that difficult. Um, and walking is a good example. <laughs> I think most people walk rel relatively well. It doesn't take a lot of difficulty to do that. But there was a time in your life when it was extremely difficult because you didn't know how to do that. That's an extreme example, but it highlights the point. When you have the skill to do something, it becomes very easy. And I have a number of friends who are in the, the high end of wealth category, and for them, making money and having money is is easy, and they follow some principles, which is what this – podcast is about is talking about those principles so that you can do them and and have that money as well if that's what you choose and we look at it and go well yeah my situation is different you know if I only had money it would be easier um, the statistics prove that that's not true over 70 percent of people that win the lottery lose it all within five years it's not a case of having money will solve the problem. If you're not, don't have the right skill set, you won't hold on to that that money. Which is, I said, it's the vast majority of people who win or uh, bequeath money lose it very quickly within a few years of, of getting it. And that can be there's put in the statistics are people winning a million to you know five hundred million, they they just lose it. They spend it, it goes. The other thing, I mean, we look at it as well. I mean, when I look at my friends, I've had a number of friends that have been in the opposite situation where they haven't had a lot of access to money. They haven't had a lot of um, ability to earn money. A friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine from some time ago, she was a single mum pretty much from, from birth. The, I mean, the father decided to leave. And... But in the seven years up to when I met her, um, she managed to, she couldn't, she didn't earn a lot of money. She wasn't um, highly skilled. The, the jobs that she were doing were just, you know, assistant type jobs, very low paid. And, but in the seven years from the, the child's, her child's birth to, to when I met her, she managed to save um, $40,000. Now that's, you know, that's a big chunk of change. 
uh, for someone that doesn't earn much. And because I, I hear people say that quite regularly, is that oh, you know, if I if I could earn more money, well, that that's one of the steps, and we'll talk about that. But even when you don't earn much money, um, so what my friend showed was she not only didn't she earn much, she had a child to look after, to pay for, to care for. She had to pay for her own um, you know, living as well. And she managed to save money. And another, um, it's actually a close family friend of mine, a separate um, lady who, similar sort of situation, well, similar but worse, she had four children, um, uh, two different dads. The, the first child she had, the, the dad left. And the child was deaf. And then she met another person that had a relationship, got pregnant. Um, then when she was having the baby, he left. <laughs> um, after that, he came back, got pregnant again, this time with twins, <laughs> and then he left. So she's bringing up four children by herself with minimal income, same token, managed to save and, and have a security um, amount of money there to the extent that when she needed a new car she went out and paid cash for it bought a brand new minivan and paid cash for it so when i look at that it really goes to show it's not about whether you have money because people that are, get a lot of money they lose it people that don't have money manage to put it all together and make it happen so how do they they do that this is where I'm going to want to talk about the book. It's The Richest Man in Babylon by George S. Carlson. Now, this book was written in 1928, so it's nearly 100 years old. Um, and the principles in that book apply just as much then as they do today. And in the book, there are what's called Seven Cures for a Lean Purse and Five Laws of Gold. Now, they, some of them interrelate, so I'll, I'll deal with them together. And the first one is, the first cure for a lean purse is start thy purse fattening. And it says save 10%, which is the first law of gold. Gold cometh gladly an increasing quantity to any person who will put not less than one-tenth of their earnings to create an estate for their future and that of their family. Now, that's a pretty simple goal, really, when you think about it, or simple instruction. Save 10% of what you earn. And from my experience, yeah, I've known that for a long time, and I never did it. <laughs> I did do it sometimes, and then I'd take it, and then I'd spend it all. And, and sometimes I saved a lot more, and then I'd spend it all. So this is where it's the mindset of, of having that money comes into play. It's really important to see yourself as a person. When you look at, for example, Warren Buffett, I mean, Warren Buffett is one of the wealthiest people on the planet. He earns more, you know, substantial amounts of money, yet he drives um, an everyday car. He lives in the same house that he originally bought. And you know, so it's not about, you know, where, where the money, it's about your mindset to do with the money as to whether you can, can save that 10%. And the, what you want to be doing is get to the point where you save that, and we'll get to the other principles, but you save that 10% up to the point where that money then starts out earning your ability to spend it because then you can shift. If you do want to um, quit working, then you can. And it's, it's interesting that all the people I know that are super wealthy, which is a number of people, none of them have stopped working, nor do they want to. It's a, it's a fascinating thing that the people that are working doing something that you know, they probably don't like or because they have to, they're like, oh, if only I could have enough money that I'd quit working and uh, I could just travel around. Whereas the people that have the money to just not work, they want to in continue doing the work. But part of that I notice from the people that I've seen doing that is because the work that they're doing is actually giving back to society. It's make, making society a better place. So why would you want to stop doing that? I understand why they would do that. 
they, what they're doing is providing benefits to people, helping people, and making the world a better place, of course they want to keep working because that feels really good. It's not about the money. But the first step is you do need to save that 10%. Now, how do you do that? It really is a case of, of making that the first thing that you do. So you have a separate bank account. Um, and it all it depends on your circumstance as well. I mean, you know, some people have to do things a little. If you've got a lot of debt and you're in a really difficult financial position, there's a number of programs out there that will will help you to to overcome that. Um, if you don't have a lot, you might be young. If you're if you're young and living at home, you know, you should, should be able to save a lot more than ten percent. And this is um, one of the other principles we'll get to about compounding. How the more you do early the better off you're going to be so much faster. But you want to get into a position where you just immediately, as soon as you get some money, that goes into a separate account that is for investing and for growing, and you just don't touch it. You don't look at it. Well, I'd like to say don't look at it, but I yeah, look at it all the time. Uh, but you put it aside and you, you take it out first, and then you deal with whatever happens with the rest. And it's not really... A discipline. It's not hard. It's it's a desire and a want, uh, and that was the shift for me. Was I changed from you know wanting to do all this stuff, which I still want to do all this stuff, but it, not at the expense of taking the the money out of that purse. That ten percent comes out first, goes separate, and it just gets invested and compounded. And that's part of the seven cures for a lean purse. The second cure is control thy expenses, and which is a natural flow on from the saving 10%. You need to control your expenses to to save that 10%. And it it depends on your circumstance. Sometimes that you you know you'll be in a position where you are able to buy extra things because you have that extra income and we'll get to those points in a moment those principles but if you're not in a position then you look at well how do i control my expenses what can i do to more efficiently use the money that i've got to still get the same result and there's a whole bunch of stuff on the internet about how to do that and you want to look at okay well how do i how do i adjust things how do i you know um do things in a more economical manner to control my expenses. So that's the, the second cure. The third, um, it's the third cure for a lean person, the second law of gold, is make thy gold multiply. Invest and to compound the investment return. So that's the the set or well, the, the third cure is make thy gold multiply, and the, and the second law of gold is Gold laboreth diligently and contentedly for the wise owner who finds for it profitable employment, multiplying even as it flocks of the field. And what we're talking about there is compound interest, which Einstein said was the seventh wonder or eighth wonder of the world. There's already seven wonders, eighth wonder of the world. And it truly is uh, an amazing phenomena where it doesn't seem like much is happening. Initially, especially if you're dealing with low amounts of, of money, um, that becomes, it doesn't seem like much is happening. But if you do the math behind it, you can see that it does grow quite substantially the longer you leave it, which is why Warren Buffett's in the position that he's in. Um, he's he's made good returns. There's no question about that. but where that return stands out most is he started very young and continued to invest. So he not only did he invest, he put money away. When that money earned more money, he reinvested that to compound compound that effect. Um, and this is a real important point because you want to get to that point because it, it, it will eventually get to the point where the investments that you're doing Earn much more than you can spend. Some people go, oh, yeah, probably not. But it, it does get to that point where you're earning such an amount of money, you cannot spend it. If you want to have a, an example of that, watch the movie Brewster's Millions. It's an old movie, but um, it, it highlights that point. 
And this is where we go, okay, make that goal multiply. How do we do that? You need to look at the type of situation that you're in. Now, if you're in a um, a situation where you're not earning much money, or you're 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 younger and you, you don't have that income yet, one of the things I mean, you have to look at the investments that that suit your um, where you are currently, and you want to look at and we'll get to these principles as well. One, protecting it because that's another part of it, and two, you know, knowing what you're doing. And this is where you really important to focus and understand where you're at. If you're not earning much money and you don't have a great income, then property investment might not be the best return because you might not have enough deposits to to get a property loan. You might not um, you might not have the income to support a loan. That, that kind of thing. So that can be a, an inhibitor. So you need to look at what you can do. One of the things you can do with a little bit of, of money, as small as $500, so once you save $500, you can, um, well, certainly in Australia, and I'm sure it's similar in other countries, you can buy stock, shares in a company on the stock market. Um, I know with uh, the brokerages here, minimum purchase is $500. So that's not a lot of money to, to save up. And then, well, what do you do? How do you, how do you, you do that? Well, how do you choose the stocks? Well, that's one thing. Again, you need to put a little bit of science behind it, and I'll share a few things a bit later on. But you want to look at something that's going to give you security. But one of those things that we talked about it was make that gold multiply, invest, and to compound the investment return by – by and large, what that high, well, what's in that statement is you're looking for an investment that's going to give you a return that you can reinvest, which probably the best way to do that would be finding stocks that pay dividends. A good one, a good strategy that my, my dad used um, was he would look for stocks that were paid consistent dividends. They had a history of paying consistent, consistent dividends. Um, but they were undervalued. And how you would work out that they were undervalued is you would take the current bond yield, you'd add 2% to that. So just say the bond yield is currently five, uh, 3%, you'd add 2%, make it 5%. If the, if, and he'd be watching companies that have good dividend yields, if their dividend yield dropped below um, or went up above 5%, he would buy it, as simple as that, because it just showed that that, it was a good indicator that that company was undervalued. Simple, simple tool. And, but it is one checking you know, the financials of the company. Is that main being consistent? Is the, um, has the dividend yield been, uh, the dividend being paid consistent? Which is not difficult to do. Most um, brokers, you know, you can, uh, will give you that information for free. You just need to look up, put the stock code in, look at the, the history and, and it'll give you that detail. Uh, and that was a really, he made a lot of money out of that strategy, just, just consistently as a stock, <clears throat> as a, when the stock was showing value, i.e. the dividend yield was above whatever the bond yield plus 2% was, he'd just buy, buy it with whatever cash he had and just con continue to, to increase it that way. And, and that yield, not only that, he'd get paid the dividend, which he'd then reinvest, which is what we're talking about, making gold multiply. And so this is really important from that perspective is finding where you're at and what you can do. And as you get more money, you might be looking at property, which is an, another good investment as well. Uh, you just, again, need to put some sense into that, and that's one of the principles. So the, the fourth cure for a lean purse is to guard thy treasures from loss. Avoid the risk of loss and investing in get-rich-quick schemes which is what it specifically says, which also fits within from the five laws of gold, laws three and five. Law three says gold clingeth to the protection of a cautious of the cautious owner who invests it under the advice of people wise in its handling. And that's the, that's the third law of gold. The fifth law is gold flees the person who would force it to impossible earnings or who followeth the alluring advice of tricksters and schemers, or who trusts it to her own 
their own experience and their romantic desires in investment. Now, there's a lot in that. <laughs> there's a lot in that. Um, and this is where it's really important. Firstly, you know, avoid the risk of loss. The first part of invest. Invest under the advice of people who are wise in its handling. Well, who who is the best person to look after your money? Yourself. You are going to be the one who's going to treat it with the most care. And of all the people that um, that I know that are really wealthy, they know what they're investing in. They don't invest in anything that um, they don't understand. And they very much stick to their own area. They they literally are very focused in their investing. That and you know people will talk about diversification. Uh, Warren Buffett mentions diversification. I think it was Warren Buffett. I'm on along those lines anyway. So diversification is diversification. Um, probably not a good analogy um, or good use of English. But if you look at that, you know, those people, even Warren Buffett's share portfolio is, is not a lot. Yes, he owns a lot of companies progressively, but only in the area that he has knowledge about. Um, him and Charlie Munger, they, they operate within what they call a circle of competence. They stay within that. They don't go outside of that because they know when they're looking at an investment, they understand it. They know that it makes sense. They don't want to lose money. As, as Warren Buffett's two, two rules of investing are, don't lose money. And second rule is see the first rule. And this is where it's really important to really understand what it is you're investing in. Know what you're investing in. And things like there's a lot of, a lot of um, when you look at it. I mean, Bitcoin was uh, and cryptocurrency was big recently, um, and a lot of people were getting into that. Even highly educated people were investing in in Bitcoin and not understanding what it is. I'd say majority of people don't really understand what uh, cryptocurrency is. Um, and there's another podcast I've got on. We'll talk about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and, and whether that will replace normal currency. And there's a lot of people that jump on the bandwagon because we, we talk about um, in that rule five, talk about the romantic desires in investment. Well, we see everyone else, they will supposedly see everyone else having all this wealth. So we, we jump on the bandwagon and um, and that's how a lot of, price fluctuation happens and if you're very clever about it well, you don't even have to be that clever you just have to be patient um, this is where when you look at the stock market you'll notice that it, it goes up and down it fluctuates and this is where my dad's invest my dad's plan of looking at the dividend yield and just buying it when it was undervalued because the stock values and it's just having that patience not getting caught up in Oh, it's all running up. We better get it now. You you wait. It'll come back down again. If it doesn't, something else will be lower um, where you'll be able to buy that. So this is where it's really important to guard from loss and, and also to be mindful that <clears throat> if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't great investments out there. I mean, one of the roles that I play is I manage a private equity fund. Um, and it's very selective in what I choose for that fund, like really selective. There's most of the time it'll be one stock, like lots and lots of money invested in one stock. Um, yet the return we're getting is in the 35% per annum with zero risk. Well, I'll say 99% zero risk, 99% um, in that safety factor. If if the whole world tanks, yeah, it, it would um, would lose money. But generally, uh, there is zero risk there in the everyday world, uh, and that's that specialization, knowing how to do that. That requires it's not something that you can do with five hundred dollars, and does require a bit of money behind it. But you can get those kind of consistent returns without risk. So put that one aside as well that higher risk equals higher return. Um, 
Not necessarily. In a lot of cases, high risk means just that, high risk. And the way you lower the risk is, again, by having that knowledge of what you're uh, investing in and, and your circumstance as well. So you stay within that, <clears throat> that safety net of your own knowledge. So this is really important. So this is where you don't want to really, really be careful. And, and it's not, it really isn't that hard. Um, I do some very good investing. I don't read the investment journals. Don't read it. Don't need to. I need, this is where the internet's really wonderful today because in, um, when I was growing up as a kid, you got news a couple of ways from the, <clears throat> excuse me, from the, the television, the news reports. Uh, when the news was on, um, we didn't have 24-hour news channels when I was growing up, and you got it from the newspaper. That was it. And you had to go, well, newspaper was easy because you go to the parts you want. With the news, if you're watching, you had to watch, you couldn't fast-forward it or you could record it, but if you're watching it live, you couldn't fast-forward, you had to watch all these other things you don't want. That's where today, the internet, I look up the bit of information that I need. That's it. I don't look at the overall, every piece of news on everything. Because I don't need to know that. I need to specialize and know the knowledge that's important to me. The rest of it I put aside so I don't get caught up in these trends of, you know, I'm missing out on this. Um, um, the, the, the dot com, I lived through the dot com bubble where things were just going ridiculous. Um, then you had the, the Bitcoin bubble. Um, you know, that, that has, you know, but all the people, there was a news report yesterday saying it's going to go back to $100,000. Maybe, maybe. I, Doubtful, but maybe. Um, so put aside the, the news. Look at, especially the financial news, because it, it's the financial news and financial newsletters, those kind of things are to sell the financial news and the financial newsletters. That's what they're there for. You can get the knowledge you need freely. If you've got a, um, like for example, if you're into stocks, you can get that knowledge from your broker. If you've got an online broker, um, they will generally have a research um, area where you can look up the stock and get the information you need. Simple as that. And you shouldn't be relying on someone else's advice anyway because you know how do you know that what they're saying is accurate? And this is where it's, again, important to understand and protect your money by you having the knowledge in the area you're investing in. The fifth rule, um, the fifth cure for a lean purse is to make your dwelling a profitable investment. And this is really important as well because they talk about buying versus renting. Well, why would we do that? Well, I mean, there's, when people talk about rent vesting and, um, you know, oh, it's, it's better off to rent because it's cheaper than a mortgage, that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, like just on the, the buying side of things versus renting. And yes, obviously there's a step to, to get to that. Um, <clears throat> and this is where I kind of look at, again, the, the saving side of things, you know, from a buying side of things, how to get the deposit. I mean, my again, my grandparents came here with nothing um, and they managed to save. Not only did they manage to save and build their own house, so that the house I actually grew up in was the original house that my grandfather built. He built a two-room um, house and then progressively expanded that into a three-bedroom house. And then when my parents got married, my grandfather, grandmother and grandfather had saved enough money. Now, when I talk about them saving money, my grandfather never spoke English. He worked as a laborer in a coal mine. That was his job. But he didn't earn a lot of money either. So he, but in that time period, so my dad uh, was two years old when he came to Australia between, and my dad got married at 22. So in the 20 years that my grandfather was working as a laborer in a coal mine, not speaking English, he was able to save, or him and, and my grandmother were able to save enough money that when my parents got married, they gifted their house to my parents and bought a new house with cash. So they saved enough money as a 
laborer working in a coal mine to buy a new house with cash. Now that was a great advantage to my, my parents and that, that seems to be a lot of the, you know, how a lot of parents do help their children and similar sort of thing for my son. I, I, he um, has money in the equity fund that I manage and, and um, he's getting a great return because we want to help our children. But even if you're not in that circumstance, there is those abilities to do that. Yes, it's it's more challenging, but that's just the circumstance we're in and that's a whole another topic in another podcast. But this is where when you look at, we're talking about, okay, buying your own house, so making your dwelling a profitable investment. Inflation is there for a reason. Again, another podcast, have a have a listen to that one. But what happens is when you buy the house as opposed to renting, well, when you're renting, inflation, what will happen is it's each year, most likely, your rent will increase or each couple of years, whatever it is, but the rent will increase. So if you're renting for 20 years, the rent will in- increase and either match, well, let's say it matches your income. So as you move forward, your rent increases, um, your income increases, you have the same amount of, of money to invest. When you buy a property, you buying it as a loan, let's say you're putting down um, 10% or 12, whatever percentage is, but you're getting a loan. When that, you know, let's put aside uh, rate increases and changes, let's say the interest rate is the same. Now, what happens there is that loan calculation is calculated at today's dollars and will stay at today's dollars. So putting aside rate changes, but it will stay at today's dollars. So let's say you're paying um, uh, $3,000 a month for a mortgage, pick a figure, whatever that figure is, and and your income's say $5,000 a month. And I'm just making these figures up. So that disparity is you've got $2,000 a month left over. Probably not great figures because that's probably not accurate, but anyway. Um, the point is that in 20 years' time, you'll be almost m- most likely paid off at the last part of the payments, but in 20 years' time, your loan payment will still be $3,000, but your income might be $10,000 depending on what inflation is. So that's and assuming that your income um, matches inflation. So you haven't gone to earn any more or anything like that. You just income matches it. The the loan payment will stay the same in today's dollars, but your income will constantly increase. So you will have the between the difference between renting and paying a mortgage over time. You are so much better paying a mortgage because you have that. And a lot of times what happens is people will, um, and depending on which country it is too, when you sell the house, it it's tax, can be tax-free. Certainly in Australia, you know, the house that you rent, you live in, um, if it's your house and you sell it, and that's what a lot of people do. They'll, they'll buy a house for the family, and then when they get to a certain age, they sell the house, they downsize to something smaller, and they've got a whole bunch of cash tax-free. So that's part of making your dwelling profitable. The other part of that is also running a business from your um, your house. Now, I'm not going to get into the, the tax implications and things like that, but there are there are tax implications for claiming things. But when you run a business from your house, you have the ability to claim things that you can't claim as an employee. And so, and and those maybe we'll do some specialist seminars on 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 that and um, we'll bring in some people that are experts in those to, to guide you um, but again each country is different so <clears throat> this is a global podcast and we need to address each, each you will need to address your circumstances uh, to the laws in in your your country but certainly if you're running a business from your dwelling there are bigger advantages um, by doing so so that's another thing you want to consider, and that's where the, the um, of the seven cures, the fifth cure of uh, a lean purse is to um, make your dwelling an profitable investment. And there, there are two ways of doing it. One is that by buying it over time, 
your income will increase and your loan payments will stay the same, whereas your renting inflation will push up your rent to match your income, um, assuming that they stay uh, in parity as time goes on. And the other one is that if you are running a business from your from your home, you can um, you certainly there's are, are advantages to doing that financially um, that will increase your bottom line. But again, seek a, a special advice on that one. Um, next point this is for the seven cures, the six cures to ensure a future income. Um, so it's and this is to make sure that you know you, you're constantly looking at at how to earn that money. So how do we make sure that we we keep earning money? One is you know obviously being employable, um, or if you're running a business, looking for new markets, that kind of thing, and you want to make sure that you, you know you're looking ahead to to constantly earning money and then transferring that money to what's called passive income. So income. Passive income is, say, rental income where you, know, you own investment properties and someone will pay you, know, you rent and you, you really don't have to do much. You can actually hand that over to a real estate agent and you can sit back and, and collect the rent um, or from shares you can collect dividends. You don't have to do anything about that. And if you're really sophisticated, you can write calls against your shares and collect that income as well. So there, there are some options for that future income. And then the... Seventh cure for a lean purse is increase the ability to earn. Keep developing your own skills to increase your investment wisdom and also to increase your earning power. And this is you know, when you start out as an employee, you know, there's a limited amount that you can do because you don't have a lot of skill by comparison to someone that's been working for 20 years and, and increasing their knowledge. So there's your your value is limited because you could be easily replaced and that's where you want to look at from that perspective i mean one is look at what you enjoy doing and generally you can earn money doing pretty much anything uh, so look at what you enjoy and you can earn a lot of money doing what you enjoy um one of the wealthiest people uh significantly wealthy billionaire um, was the the man that started the Peanuts cartoon and how he managed that enabled him to earn substantial wealth. So, and that was drawing cartoons. It's not so much, and the, the difference are probably in today's world when you look at it, um, when you look at Oprah Winfrey compared to, say, Jeremy Clarkson, both were hugely popular um, some people like them, some people hate them, but they were certainly hugely popular and hugely successful in their own right. The difference being Oprah ended up being a billionaire and Jeremy Clarkson wasn't. Well, why? Because Oprah owned the show that um, she was in and uh, produced. So she was the owner of that. Whereas Top Gear, the show that Jeremy Clarkson was on, was owned by the BBC. So he got paid an income from that. Yes, he got paid a lot of money, but he didn't get all the benefit of that because he didn't own it. And this is the difference you want to look at. Okay, how can I put myself in a position where I'm owning the asset, I'm creating the asset and owning it that's earning money? Because that's going to reap a huge amount of difference uh, over time. And that's part of developing your wisdom, developing your knowledge. So how do I do this? How do I not just earn the money? How do I have that extra value? How do I provide that value? And that's one of the things that a lot of people make money from is, is I look for problems. Because if you can solve somebody else's problem, that's where you can earn a lot of money. Because a lot of people... You know, they, there are a lot of problems out there and they don't know how to deal with it. But if you can find that problem to solve and do it well, then pe more people no doubt will have that same problem and will pay you for it. So they're the things what you want to be doing is looking for that. <clears throat> in, how do you increase your earning power? You're looking at how do I increase my knowledge, but how 
um, do I find an area, a unique problem to solve so that I can um, help other people alleviate that problem from their life and then you know you get paid for that and that's where you, you make a lot of money so that's the seventh cure for wealth now what we we skipped here is the fourth law of gold because it didn't go in order as so i was reading them out together the fourth law of gold is gold slippeth away from the man um, the person who invests it in businesses or purposes which they are not familiar or which is not approved by those skilled to keep it Again, that comes back to investing and not being aware of what you're doing. Um, jumping on the dot-com bandwagon, for those who are old enough to remember it, uh, a lot of people invested in, in companies they knew nothing about just because the trend was there and they lost a lot of money. Um, there's certainly a lot of people that have paid you know, 80 odd thousand dollars for, for Bitcoin and now you know, they've lost... 75% of that value, um, a little bit more actually. And, you know, they didn't really understand what they were doing. And this is where I, I personally made the choice of only to look at the things that I'm interested in. I'm not trying to, it, there's lots and lots of ways to make money. You don't need to understand all of them. All you need to do is pick one and do it really well. If you do that really well, you're going to make millions of dollars. It's that's pretty much guaranteed. If you follow these steps, save 10%, control your expenditures, multiply the, the investment earnings that you have, so take, invest that 10%. When that earns income, reinvest that and continue to do that. Of guarding your treasures from loss, making sure you don't lose money. Um, Warren Buffett's first rule of investment, don't lose money. Second rule, see if rule one. Make your dwelling profitable when you can Buy your own property. It makes a huge difference to your, not only your um, financial position, but your own security. When you own your own home, certainly, you know, I'm talking in countries where you know you have that right to property. Um, that gives you security. As a, a tenant, you could get kicked out at any time. Um, so it gives you security. It gives you peace of mind. Own your own property. So work towards that. Um, Ensure a future income. Make sure that you are looking ahead and going, well, how can I continue to, to earn money? Whether it's me earning it through labor or whether I'm, you know, it's through investment income. And increase your ability to earn. So gain more knowledge. And then you will further protect yourself and be able to constantly earn more money. So those, those principles are not really, I would say that they're, they're pretty easy. And I know... I'm saying that as a person that has not followed them. It's not because they weren't easy. It's just because I didn't do it. I mean, it's not hard to save 10% of the income. Just take it out, put it away, and just do that every time and, and spend what's rest. That's not hard to do. It's a choice. Um, and then when you get paid investment income, roll it over. It just becomes a habit. And that's where you, you, this is a mindset. And I talked about earlier in the podcast that the mindset of earning money, <clears throat> so shifting the mindset from earning more, from earning less than you earn, spend less than you earn, to earning more than you spend, makes a big difference because it taps into that um, increasing your ability to earn because you're looking, oh, how can I earn more money to cover my expenses, the things how I want to live, and. And also to that mindset of, of this money is in the background. This is my house that's in my background that's that's paid off. Um, and also to this is you know this investment here is investment that sits there to continue to earn more. I mean, can you imagine being you know Warren Buffett sitting there with like hundreds? Well, he's got billions of dollars just sitting there. Could just take it and spend it, but has no desire to he drives around in his you know, everyday car and lives in his house you know, which no doubt is paid off um so his expenses have got to be minimal um he plays bridge for entertainment so these kind of things it's like you know find what works for you obviously if you, you like and i like you know luxurious things but i'd always make sure that i earn more than i spend 
So in having money is relatively easy. Follow, if you need to, get the book, George S. Carlson's The Richest Man in Babylon. There are The Seven Cures for a Lean Purse, Five Laws of Gold, and you should be well on your way to providing that security for yourself and for your family and having the resources to be able to give to others, whether it's you know giving to people individually or giving money to help people develop things like you know, cures for cancer. This is where money is really important. Thank you for being part of the Share.Care community and helping people around the world prosper. You're creating a bigger pie for everyone to share. The more people contributing to the world being a better place, the better the world becomes for others and for you.